Well, as I said earlier, we have a very special guest with us today. And you may be familiar with that well-known Bible verse in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where the Apostle Paul tells us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So today we are talking about our minds. And there's something deeply relevant to individuals, families, and communities today in that Bible verse I just read out as we reflect on our modern addiction to screens and technology. Today we're talking about Christians and the addiction to technology and dealing with the fracturing of our attention spans. So our special guest today is about to launch a new podcast called The Space Makers. He's an award-winning author named Daniel C., He's joining us to talk about the first season of this podcast, dealing with why we can't concentrate anymore and how to rebuild our attention muscles. Daniel is the author of a book, Raising Tech Healthy Humans, How to Reset Your Children's Tech Habits and Give Them a Great Start to Life. His earlier book was Spacemaker, How to Unplug, Unwind and Think Clearly in the Digital Age. He's an award-winning author, a TED speaker, and a productivity expert. And it's our great pleasure to welcome Daniel on to 2020 today. Daniel, welcome. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me on the show, Andrew. Yeah, well, I'm really looking forward to today's topic, Daniel, because it is relevant to everyone. Uh, we had a, a lady on Rise and Shine this morning, a grandma, a beautiful old grandma, who you would think is you know, not in touch with the digital age, but she was saying she had a problem that someone sent her a... Uh, a little puzzle, which when she completed the puzzle, it was actually the rude finger being sent to her, and she accidentally sent it on to one of her in-laws. And so I don't think there's anyone in Australia today that is untouched by technology. And so this topic is relevant to all of us, our addiction to screens and technology and, and really just the clutter in our minds. So tell me, Daniel, what led you into this space? Mm, yeah, look, I, I never thought I'd be a productivity expert. I started as a physiotherapist and then a church pastor. But eventually, uh, look, through my writing and through reading, I just started to see how much of an impact technology has on our life for good. You know, there's some wonderful, beautiful, amazing things about the online world and opportunities it brings. But I also started to recognize, at least in the leaders that I coach, some of the challenges of being online too much. And so, I spent seven years uh, researching a book about how to make space for adults who feel like they're online so much and think clearly and to live full lives. And then, you know, that I suppose became something. And now I spent a lot of my life talking about how to make space and regain our attention in an attention economy. Yeah, so you spent seven years researching Spacemaker. That was released a couple of years ago. So we're, we're talking about, what, a nine to ten year period of time there. Have you seen any change in digital habits or the impact of technology on society even in that 10-year window? Oh, tremendous and a tremendous amount of change, but but the same trajectory, which is fascinating. So when I first, the, the book began, my first book, Space Maker, began uh, when I wrote a blog post, and this was nearly a decade ago, and it was why I have a digital Sabbath by turning off my phone for a day a week, okay? And this is a, you know, broad, I mean, I don't write and speak uh, in a religious context, I just have a business. So the ABC and a bunch of other kind of media outlets picked up that idea because no one was talking about the idea that you might want to deliberately turn off your devices. Now, if you fast forward to today, the idea that we're soaked in technology, we're feeling fractured in our mind, we're struggling with concentration and feeling stressed and overwhelmed because we're online a bit much, that is now not a radical idea. I think almost everyone realizes this to be true, and that, that happened post-COVID. So I think the, the trajectory was happening. It's just it was amplified in lockdown, and now we're aware, increasingly aware, that a bit too much technology can be problematic. Absolutely. But do you think, Daniel, that people have answers for that dilemma, or do you think people in the modern world have just accepted it and, and just lived that way? Yeah, I think the answers is where we really need to get to. So I think we're at the stage where I think there's enough evidence, research and, and thinking out there to realise we have a problem. Uh, but th the answers is what I'm really interested in. This is why I'm a productivity consultant. So I actually help people to actually think about what can we do to practice things differently. Uh, and so it might be worth talking about neuroplasticity and internet practice and and some actual practical ways we can retrain our minds, our relationships and our communities 
so that we get the best out of the online world without becoming overwhelmed by our screens. And that's what my <clears throat> my podcast is essentially about. Well, Daniel, you know, to coin a phrase, Houston, we have a problem. I don't want to spend the next, you know, 45 minutes talking about problems, but I do want to lay a foundation. So can you give me some data or some stats on just the negative impacts of screen addiction and too much technology in the average Australian today? What sort of an impact is it having? Yeah, so look, when we look at the impact, there's two ways you could look at it because one, there's the anecdotal impact of what I see everywhere I go because I do work with a lot of companies, corporations and and adults who are struggling with overuse. But probably from the research you'd go, I would dive first into mental health research uh, in young people. And because I think young people are kind of like the canary in the coal mine in the sense of the experience of being online too much uh, particularly social media, particularly with internet browsing, that, that that's impacting us all. But in young people, you see very marked differences in their mental health outcomes. And it seems that there's a direct link to how much time they're spending online. So uh, the US Surgeon General re- released a report last year, an advisory on social media. Uh, he said that in America, but I think it wouldn't be that different in Australia. In America, the average teenager is now using social media three hours to five hours a day. Uh, which is an enormous amount of time. Uh, And when kids use technology for three hours or more a day, they have worse mental health outcomes, so much higher levels of depression, anxiety, self-harm, and tragically suicide. And so what we're seeing is the average amount that the American teenager is using social media is creating significant levels of mental health distress and and social issues uh and there's a whole lot of evidence that shows that too much time online is bad for our brains our relationships and our health so that can play out into the adult realm which i'm happy to talk about but uh there's lots of evidence in terms of young people yeah and i think if you look at the education standards of australia they've dropped dramatically on a worldwide uh rating and there's countries which are almost third world, which are outperforming our kids now in basic maths, English science. And I think that is definitely a side effect of our technology addiction because those same kids that aren't reading and writing and calculating as well as kids were 30 years ago are very tech savvy. They know. Yeah, look, and what's, <laughs> I agree. I agree. And it's, and it's not accidental. I mean, we'll talk, we could talk about the design of tech, but what's fascinating, I mean, TikTok is owned by, you know, a Chinese based company. And what's interesting is uh, when Western kids use TikTok, the algorithm pushes them to want to be influencers and to be famous. And there's just a lot of kind of inane, fun, crazy videos uh, about body image and what you look like and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if you look at the algorithm in China, and this is what I've seen or heard, um, I haven't actually read research on it, but it, it seems to be accurate. Uh, the algorithm pushes kids to want to be engineers and to, to be scientists. So when you ask the average teenager in Australia, what do you want to be? It's an influencer or someone famous in a successful way. If you ask kids in China, they want to be engineers and famous rocket scientists. So again, uh, the algorithms themselves are shaping and curating what we give attention to. And then that is then shaping our values, our beliefs and our practices, which is which is a very interesting phenomenon. Well, it's also a very smart play by China who wants to, you know, effectively dominate the world. They're, uh, they're definitely manipulating the social media app there to uh, to favour their own children and and laughing at us. But so these are these are real problems, Daniel. And obviously, we've got pornography. That's a whole different issue. I heard someone uh, on a podcast recently in America say the average age now in America for a child to access pornography is nine. And that's mm. usually through a smartphone, and which is horrible. And like he said, he said that means there's seven-year-olds watching it too, and there's 11-year-olds watching it for the first time. And that in itself is a nightmare scenario, which we could talk about for a long time. But I want to move on to, to positive things, Daniel. So let's pretend someone has met you in the shopping center today. They said, hey, you're Daniel C. I saw you on that TED Talk on, on YouTube. Daniel, I'm addicted to my screen. I can't get off my phone. Give me, give me two things I can do today to help me break this cycle of, of screen addiction. What would you say? Yeah, so unfortunately, I wouldn't say there's just one quick life hack that's going to solve the problems of the digital economy, but I definitely have some solutions. So look, one, and I don't want to say this in a way of promoting it, but this is why we did the podcast. One is I would encourage you to listen to the podcast because there's 10 short, sharp episodes, which is a specific uh, podcast to answer that exact question. And is um, this the Space Maker podcast? This is the Space Maker. I yes. love it's that about- name, Space Maker. It reminds me of that cartoon I loved when I was a kid called Space Ghost. Do you remember Space Ghost? 
<laughs> Best cartoon space ever. Space Ghost. Anyway, yeah, Space Maker, very <laughs> memorable. And so, okay, so there's a podcast called Space Maker. You would point the person towards that. What else would you suggest? Well, I suppose the reason I would point them to that is because I think there are three things I would recommend, which we go through over the 10 episodes. Uh, I think there are three things that I would say for an adult to reshape their attention and to focus on what matters. Uh, the first thing is I'd say you need to know your why, uh, which is a bit counterintuitive. It's not like go straight to screen time apps and, you know, getting rid of socials. Like what I say is the first thing you need to know is what really matters. Like what is the life you want to live? What are your values? Uh, you know, if you're a person of faith, uh, what's the calling that you have on your life? Because if you're not clear about what your greater why is, your greater yes is, well, then every kind of digital distraction that's vying for your attention is going to be a yes. It's hard to say no unless you know what your greater yes is. That's the Stephen Covey term. And so, yeah, the beginning of our podcast helps people start to think about who are they, what would they love to see in the next few years, and how might they shape their time around what really matters. Uh, so we start with a positive vision of life, which yep. may be a bit counterintuitive, but I think that's the first step. Love it. Uh, love, it I continue? love it. Love it. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So the second step is uh, curate your digital environment, which means re try to reduce the amount of uh, distracting inputs that you put in your life. Now, you can't help all of it because we're in a, in a culture where no matter what you try to do, you can walk down the street and there'll be billboards vying for your attention. But, um, you know, if you're on social media, well, maybe think about deleting social media apps from your phone. Uh, what about getting rid of email notifications using screen time, you know, getting rid of all notifications from your phone, maybe put your phone on grayscale, maybe block the internet at night after a certain amount of hours. You can use kind of the inbuilt mechanisms of your phone to, hey, say the phone doesn't have internet before 7 in the morning and after 9.30 at night. There's a whole lot of guardrails we might want to put into place as adults that we would recommend for our kids, but we should do it for ourselves to help us to, to, to not get sucked into the vortex of low-quality digital activity. So, therefore, the activity we do online is valuable and the other stuff we do offline is valuable. So, that's the second step. Uh, Love it. Well, that, that's a, well, actually, oh, yeah. that's three because number one is watch uh, or listen to um, your podcast, Space Maker, <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and then the, the next two you go. Yeah, so that's, that's your big three. But Daniel, and I, I want to get some more out of you. Obviously, we really want to you know dig the gold out of your life today, and you've got so much truth in this area. But I do want to just put it out there. I'd love to hear your story to our listeners, and I want to hear some positive stories. Has someone else listening today? realized a year or two ago or a few years ago that these screens, the technology, your smartphone was sucking up all your time. It was really taking over your life and you did something to get out of that cycle or out of that pattern. I would love you to call us today on 1-800-316-316 or maybe you're struggling right now either for yourself or for one of your kids or, or all of your kids and you'd like to pick Daniel's brains about what you can do in a positive way to you know, help your kids or help yourself get out of this pattern and out of this cycle so that we're not overcluttered and just really overwhelmed by our technology. But especially, have you got a positive story about how you decluttered your life and regained your focus uh, by moving away from technology? Give us a call today on one 800 316 316. We've got Daniel C. with us today. We're going to take a short break and after that, taking your calls and digging deeper to get the gold out of Daniel C. here on Vision. But Daniel, I've got a question to ask you. Why did you get into this area and did you once upon a time struggle with technology yourself? So, so I was a physiotherapist in my 30s and I was also a part-time, I was working a lot in my church and volunteering. I think I was building a house and I actually found that I nearly burnt out. So for me, uh, that looked like uh, I, I didn't sleep very well for a while and then I started to have breathing issues. And so I, I was like breathless in front of my team or standing in front of crowds and then eventually I felt breathless at the dinner table and breathless kind of reading, you know, the Gruffalo board books to my young kids. And uh, that was seriously concerning for me. And I thought there was something wrong. And so I had all these tests and thankfully there's nothing wrong with my heart or my lungs, but the doctor heard about my lifestyle and he just said, I think this is anxiety. And, uh, and it was, I, I didn't recognize it at the time, but my body was saying, uh, no, you, you need more space and you've overcooked it. And so 
that that kind of took me on a journey, particularly because I had another good friend actually who burnt out at a similar time, and he ended up in hospital and has never been the same again. And so I could see where that was heading, and I started to open up the scriptures and, you know, read about if <laughs> unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain, and and just having this sense that um, we need to abide or rest in God and let Him prune us. And so I had this, I suppose, inner journey where I started to discover that actually the way to truly be human and faithful and, and also productive, because I'm a productivity consultant, is to actually slow down and to do less and to make space, which is why I ended up creating a company called The Space Makers. And, Can I just uh, stop there, Dan, and yeah. ask you, so yeah, you yeah. had anxiety, your doctors you know, recognised anxiety as an issue. Was it that you were worried about something in particular or your brain was just overwhelmed with too much activity, too much information, and it was creating a subconscious anxiety which really had no root cause in anything in particular? Yeah, great question. So I don't think I felt worried. I'm not a warrior, and so that's why I didn't recognize it as anxiety. I think it's more the physical symptoms of anxiety kind of overtook what was necessarily going on in my mind. I, I would say I felt stressed because I had cooked, I had committed to too much but basically, I had too many inputs in my life. Like you said, I had too many commitments. I didn't rest enough. Uh, even even when I had days off, I didn't know how to rest. One of the things I write about in my book is I think that we we give it, we we learn skills for work and to, and we learn skills for how to work, and then we assume that when we're not at work, we're resting. And I actually think that is a false premise, particularly when many of us work from home and there's a blur of work and life. I actually think we have to give attention to what might it look like to learn to rest. So I, I had to do that myself. Uh, so I think it was a culmination of a number of things, too much work, too many commitments, too much online activity without patterns of slowing down, being still, having space and connecting with community. And all those things I put into my life as patterns uh, which I call space maker habits now. Oh, I love that space maker habits. Now I want to really dig deeper into this whole concept of rest. So you said you had to learn how to rest. I think this is relevant for so many of us. What did you do, practically speaking, to learn how to rest? Yeah. So for me, I think rest involves. I realised I needed deep time for deep thinking. I needed time for deeper relationships, uh, and and just time for deep rest, like not working. Uh, and so I started to create very practical rhythms in my life. So, for example, a deep thinking rhythm. I, this might sound a bit full on, but I booked a full day every season, some autumn, winter, spring, to walk on the beach with a journal without a phone and actually just reflect and think about my life and where I'm heading and where I'm going. And so that helped me think about the bigger things in life. And that led me to starting businesses and writing books and all these other things. But I had to pause in order to take that time to reflect and know who I was. So, that's so hang on, a, so how often were you doing that? What was the, the? I just do that once a quarter. I've done it for 10 years now. So as in summer, autumn, winter, spring, I have a day on the beach. I walk up and down Blackman's Bay Beach in Tassie. Uh, if it's cold and wet, I might spend more time in the cafe with my journal. But um, yeah, that's one pattern where I have a rhythm of deep thought. Uh, I have other rhythms of thinking, like I write a, my thankfulness journal every morning. So that's a daily pattern of thinking. Uh, I go for a 15-minute walk without earbuds to music or podcasts. I've once or twice as another way of present and listening Talked about rest, but I think thinking is part of rest. If you can't – I know a lot of people who fill their mind up with so many podcasts – even if it's, let's say, good stuff like sermons and, and you know positive messages, but because we're just filling our mind with more and more and more and more and not making enough space to just process it and be still and to sit quietly, uh, sometimes that input can be negative because there's not enough space to hear your own thoughts and to hear God's thoughts rather than simply hear other people's ideas. Does that make sense? It makes a whole lot of sense, and that's why I wanted to know how often you do those walks, because I sometimes think this, I think, you know, people like Isaiah, the book of Isaiah is his life's work, and he was a guy that would have spent a lot of time alone, a lot of time with God, you know, time with people as well, and he just came up with this incredible revelation. The book of Isaiah is one of the most incredible books I think ever written in history, uh, and one of my faves in the Bible, and Paul the Apostle, 
You know, imagine Paul being alive today, you know, managing his social media, you know, maybe tweeting some things out and updating his Instagram and his Facebook, plus uploading his podcast, maybe interviewing people. Like, he would have had such a cluttered life too. You wonder, could he have written so many books of the New Testament in the modern world because his life would have been so busy? And I think... I really like that, intentionally or deliberately going away and having no phone on you and just letting your brain sift and think through ideas. I think it's the way God made us. I think Adam did a lot of this in the garden. He certainly did a lot of it in the garden before Eve was created. But even after Eve, I'm sure, well, when she was tempted, he wasn't there. So he was out gardening or walking or hanging out with the lions. I don't know what he was up to. But I think that alone time is something missing in the modern world, isn't it? Look, every every saint in history Every generation of spiritual forefathers have taken out time in the wilderness to be silent and to contemplate and to pause and rest as a rhythm, as a practice. Uh, You know, I think the Ignatius rhythms, they start and end the day, and I think they have one in the middle where they reflect on, like, their life and what's gone well and what hasn't. But instead, in the modern world, we wake up, and what's the first thing we reach for? It's typically the phone, which is waking us up, and then we typically press whatever app kind of has our attention and then so we start the day with bad news or uh, frantic information and then we end the day by scrolling on our phones as well and so i really think we're experiencing solitude and silence deprivation in the west and that is the cause i think of a lot of our mental health challenges not not all of them i please i'm not saying i don't want to simplify this but i think we do need space to simply be and that is very precious, but it won't happen unless you're deliberate. And that's that's about putting patterns in your life. And that's part of what it means to rest. That's so good, Daniel. But So carry on. So I did interrupt you before. So that, that that's part of the overall thing. But you also said finding uh, more depth in your relationships as well. <laughs> so I'm guessing that means when you take your wife out on a date night, you don't sort of check your phone, you know, in between courses being delivered to the table. Is that is that fair? Yeah, yeah, when well, I'll say yes on radio, but you know, my bad behaviors happen as well. <laughs> Daniel, <laughs> but um, no, no, absolutely. Look, for me, um, so again, I think one of the consequences of us gravitating towards online social media, or online communities, and so much time online is that we're becoming more and more isolated from real people in real places. So, I'm a, I'm a big believer in community, uh, so much so that we ended up buying land with another family and we've lived actually side by side for 15 years together eating every week but um i've i've been involved in helping communities to form by simply eating a meal once a week together around a table and that's really been transformative in people's lives so we've got a number of communities where simply we we were just like if you know someone who you could eat with once a week create a pattern in your life and that becomes a foundational space maker rhythm so you um, and and it's not a dinner party. It's a rough and ready meal. So the the you know when people say how would I start, I'd be like, okay, invite your friend over, make sure your house is messy, cook them something that you'd be embarrassed about, like maybe not cheese on toast, but something that's very simple, like a soup, something you'd eat with your kids on a quick kind of Saturday meal, uh, and therefore it's reproducible because they can invite you back the next week, and then you can invite them back the next week, and eventually you have a community building around that pattern of putting it in first. So, yeah. And it's doable, um, isn't it? It's all about being doable. And like you said, there's such a joy in human interaction. There's such a joy in in eating together. And look, Jesus did it. Uh, We see it all through the Old Testament. Abraham entertains Mm -hmm. the angels, the three angels, and it happens to be God and two angels. And he gives them food and drink, and they're just hanging and just chatting. There's something about it, isn't it? It's a God-given thing. We see in heaven the marriage feast of the lamb that even in heaven we're going to be chilling with people and eating it's a it's a bit of heaven coming to earth isn't it? i love how you're describing it so you don't need to make a big deal out of it so it's too hard for everybody just keep it simple but just have that human interaction that is awesome mm-hmm. we are losing we really are losing community and as we lose community we lose our sense of self and uh, so we need to find ways to recapture that uh, uh, the research is incredible there's if you look at the research in terms of community and social connectedness uh, there's been massive matter like um, systematic studies which get all the different research from lots of different kind of fields and they summarize the research and and uh, susan pinker summarizes this well she says that if if you breathe fresh air let's say you live in tasmania rather than jakarta well then you'll live a bit longer because this is mortality research if you have uh 
exercise rehab after a heart attack, you increase your life. If you reduce drinking and stop smoking, clearly you'll live longer. But the thing that actually makes people live longer than all those things is to have regular contact with people you love. So to build wide and deep networks of people. And when you don't do that, you die faster. You live less happy lives. And like that, that's why we see in the Bible, we're community people. So the research always backs what we see in scripture. And so, uh, the social media, I think, has this, there's value in it in the sense of if it augments and supports real relationships where you're catching up with real people, but it's not doing that. When you're on three hours of social media a day, that's three hours you're not actually building genuine in-person relationships. So you're lowering your life satisfaction and you're actually going to, and, and it has a massive impact uh, on your health and happiness. And so we just have to recapture, recapture the joy of eating together and being people with one another that is so good i didn't know that research was out there where that people actually die sooner if they lack human interaction that is so so powerful and uh, and again it just goes back to you know god's design for man in the bible is so healthy you know love god love people get into a local church somewhere have that sense of community where there's other humans you're doing life with and you're worshiping with and you're studying the scriptures with and praying with and isn't it amazing? We go back to God's ways and things just work out better for all of us and better for society. Mm, absolutely. And look, and humans are a pain. I mean, like, you know, we're, we're, Speak for you yourself, together, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm a pain. You know, if I get together regularly with people, like inevitably there's, there's, you hurt each other, you say things that upset each other, there's tension between one person and the next. I mean, like the, the thing about community is everyone wants it, but actually we're not really willing for the cost of it. And there is a cost. Yeah. It, it hurts, but like the Bible says, iron sharpens iron. You know, the, 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 the only way to truly grow in as a mature, healthy, rounded person is to just have that regular interaction with people you're committed to often people you don't like or who don't like you, but it's that interaction that actually grows you. And at the end of your life, you'll be like, it was those interactions that made a difference. It, it was Not worth all it. the silly things I spent time on. Yeah, it was worth it. We have Daniel Sear with us. He is an award-winning author. He's written a book called Space Makers, where you might want to lean in a little closer to the radio because you don't want to miss these nuggets of gold that Daniel is delivering to us today. Now, we've also got a caller waiting to speak to uh, Daniel. And Daniel, just before we go to this first caller, I just want you to flesh out a little bit, please, um, the whole concept of rest, of being intentional with our rest. Just tell us a little bit more about that, please. Mm, yeah, no, great question. I, I started to really think about that question when I started to realize, as I mentioned before, that rest is a skill and something you need to learn. So I ended up asking myself three questions, which I thought would be easy to answer, but they weren't. It was like, what is work for me? What is rest for me? And then what does it mean for me to habitually rest? And uh, like, that's an easy question, I think, if you're uh, I don't know, an agricultural worker, if you use physical, la if you're a physical laborer, you know, work is physical, therefore rest is to not be physically active. But I'm a knowledge worker. And so I spend my time talking with people and swiping a screen and communicating online. And I realized that actually on the weekends, I was doing exactly the same thing. I just was using different apps, but my brain email and Instagram. Does that make sense? And yeah, absolutely. So, so recognizing what your work is and making sure that your time of rest does not resemble work at all. I'm sure all the builders and trades yeah. and farmers out there right now are thinking, great, on the weekends, I don't need to do all that. <laughs> I don't need to work through that list that my special person has given me to do this weekend. All those jobs. Yeah, don't blame me. Don't blame me for that. <laughs> all but, those um, jobs around the house. But I get what you're saying. Absolutely, yeah. Now, Daniel, we've got a couple of calls waiting now, so I do want to flesh out that more a little bit moving forward, and we're going to. But we have a caller who's been very patiently waiting for us. It's Anne from... Adelaide, South Australia, and welcome to the program today. Thank you very much. Hello. What would you like to ask Daniel or talk to Daniel about today? Uh, I just wanted to um, say I'm a, a carer. We took on two children um, 14 and 15 years ago. They're sisters, and they're very high special needs. They're uh, intellectually disabled and also have autism and ADHD and a list of diagnoses that uh, some of them I've never heard of before. And they are both screen addicts. One is TV screens with DVDs, particularly the Wiggles. We've had to limit that to two days a week for my sanity. 
And uh, the other one is addicted to a screen to uh, a game of uh, bursting bubbles or or putting stars on this particular screen. Uh, while they're 14 and 15, they're both about five years old with 15 years experience or 14 years experience. And um, when we take the, uh, from the 14 year old, when we take the iPad away, we just have absolute meltdowns, most violent behaviour, self harming. It's scary to see what she will do to, uh, to herself. To, to get that iPad. And, well, let's um, just stop there because the, 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 there's a lot in that and I want Daniel just to respond to that first part and then we'll come to your second part. But Daniel, yeah. straight up, I'm sure you've seen and heard this before. Daniel, what would your initial response be to this? Oh, look, firstly, I'd say, I mean, that sounds really hard and I'm, I'm sorry that that's your experience. It's actually really difficult. Uh, I'm definitely not a mental health expert or a or a, uh, a you know an expert in this field, so I actually won't give you advice because your child has very special needs. But it is a very common experience, not quite as extreme as you're expressing, but that when kids are let's say on an iPad or or gaming for a long time, they find it very very hard to get out of that world. Uh, yeah. Which uh, I'm careful about the term addiction because that is a diagnostic type uh, term, but uh, I think once any child is starting to um, withdraw from everyday life and <clears throat> once there's such extreme reactions removing a screen, well, then that is an indication, I think, that they're uh, overly dependent on certain aspects and, and you've already yeah. experienced that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The other thing is, too, she's nonverbal and there's a an app on there called Prolo Quo to Go, which is her voice. That is what she uses to communicate. So we can't actually remove the iPad. I wanted to sort of lock it, but she's savvy enough to know how to unlock that app. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was, for myself, I found it's easy to say, oh, it's no time for screens, but then I would have my phone while I'm eating breakfast and yada, yada. Uh, so what we did was... Um, I took off my Kindle from my phone, so I only read paper books um, and whatnot. Uh, I don't write letters on my phone anymore. I write them by hand um, to our sponsor children. And um, once a week, we have card night, and uh, we play the same game. Some people, there's a friend of ours that travels over an hour from the other side of Adelaide to come and visit, and he comes for dinner, and we play cards, and there's about six of us, and, uh, yeah, it's such a great night, and no one's allowed to have their phone out. And, <laughs> um, it's a game called May I. It's, there's no gambling involved, no betting, nothing. It's just a, a simple card game that we all really love. Uh, I'm a big advocate I, of uh, games. I think you've, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. That's a fantastic rhythm that you've got. Uh, can, I, yeah. can I say something that I've, that I've heard from you, that what you've taken is you've recognised that the iPad or the iPhone is a multitasking device, and there's a lot of benefits in our devices, but uh, the problem with a multitasking device, let's say you've described it perfectly, is because you want to read, if you're reading on a multitasking device, you might then get text messages and get an idea to scan the internet. So therefore, the texture of that reading experience changes. So I'm seeing a lot of people, and this is part of the advice we would give in the podcast, to actually think about what are the activities that are best done in a single type way rather than in a multitasking way. And classically, like you said, to read on a Kindle or to read a physical book so that you're separating your reading experience from the swiping of the screen, therefore you can get a better experience of that. So I think you've picked up on those research-based yeah. things intuitively. And Kindle doesn't have a nice smell about it like a book does. So, you know. <laughs> I love books. I absolutely love physical thing. books. Exactly. And one night a week I go to bed as soon as the children are in bed, so about 8.30, I go to bed and I just lay there and read and no phone. And uh, it that has been my rest. I can't get mm. over what a difference it makes. And so I just want to tell other people that may be listening, go to bed early and read a book, a book. <laughs> what, may I ask, what, what is rest? Because that's a great, great quote. What, what makes that rest for you? Uh, Can you articulate that? Um, 
the fact that I'm, uh, well, I, I look at books as a travel experience as well, even if it's in past history, like historical fiction or whatever, uh, and I find that restful. I find it restful to uh, not be sitting at the table. It's not a bright light, so it's restful for my eyes. Um, once, normally I'm up until the children go to sleep, not go to bed, but go to sleep. And so I still feel like, in a way, I'm still uh, on duty uh, mm. for them. Whereas so you're saying it's I'm restful for your heart, it's restful for your mind. Yeah, and uh, you I'm get to experience bed, other places resting. and other things that you wouldn't otherwise. Yeah, resting my cool. eyes. Yeah, resting my, it's quiet in my bedroom. Um well, until my husband snores, but that's different. And, um, yeah, it's just restful. So that's my rest one night a week. I just go to bed at about 8.30 and read. Well, and it sounds to me like you are winning. I mean, I mean that you are actually, like uh, Daniel said, you've recognised something, you've taken positive steps. And I just want to say I feel your pain too, watching those Wiggles DVDs over and over. I know my daughter, oh, gee, it was Wiggles and this band called High Five. And I, oh, I got, yeah, oh, wait, I got oh, yeah. to the point where I used to fantasize and, you know, God forgive me for this, I used to fantasize about terminating some of those high five singers because I just, <laughs> I couldn't deal with them anymore. I'm just like, and I'm not yeah. just talking about getting rid of them, I'm talking about getting rid of them creatively because I just watched those DVDs so many times. So yeah, um, we've, we've dreamt about breaking Captain Feathersword's sword so many <laughs> times. Oh, right. boy. God bless Captain <laughs> Feathersword. But, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a crazy uh, complex world and, and, um, and not to make light of your situation, you, you know, that's a really tough situation you're in there with those special needs kids but i'm sure your love and your prayers and your faith and the positive steps you're taking i'm sure it's making a big difference in their lives yep yep we we break for church on sunday and they don't uh uh they don't miss you know they get to come with us even though they say oh i don't want to go to church i say well we do this as a family and off we go so yeah they um we're, we're trying to do the best we can without their screens, but, oh, man, it's hard. And I took them down to Mount Gambia for the weekend, and believe it or not, the Wi-Fi at the hotel that we stayed at didn't work. So for the whole weekend, they didn't have screens. Oh, uh, look at that. God was and working. I tell them. <laughs> God <laughs> was, was working. <laughs> yeah, but, Anne, I want to thank you so much for your call. We do have another call awaiting, so I want to give sure. them some time as well. But, honestly, your, your thoughts and your insights today have been really helpful, and I... I'm sure it's encouraged a lot of people, and uh, and thank you for calling us on 2020 today. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Now, we have another caller, John from Perth, and we're going to go to John very shortly, but I want to remind our listeners it's 1-800-316-316. That's 1-800-316-316. Share your experiences with us. Maybe you've got a question to ask our special guest today, Daniel C. He's the author of the book Space Maker. He also wrote Raising Tech Healthy Humans, How to Reset Your Children's Tech Habits and Give Them a Great Start to Life. He's also a, a, he has appeared on TED as a TED speaker, which is no mean feat, and he's a productivity expert, and he's here today with us on 2020, answering your calls and questions, and we have a caller now, John from Perth. John, welcome. Hey, Andrew and Daniel, good to be uh, chatting with you today. What would you uh, like to talk about today, John? Yeah, I just thought the topic you're talking about, how to find places of rest and uh, relaxation and how to unwind and how to how to switch off the digital world as well, which is a challenge for all of us, I think. I do a lot of uh, work with church leaders, and uh, yeah, one of the things I find is uh, helping them get into that, that rhythm and routine of having downtime both weekly but also annually. Um, as well so yeah I, I think I've found myself that you, you've got to find places that that really cause you to switch off um, mentally um, not that you stop your brain from thinking but just if you like a positive distraction that gets you away from your, your routine of things that that can be you know tiring work-wise and so on um, give you a chance to actually uh, focus in on some um, more kind of just slow rhythms um, so one of my great habits uh, is is uh, going to sit in a cafe with a, with a long black coffee by myself. I'm an extrovert, so I spend a lot of time with people, but I find my alone time in a cafe um, reading reading uh, a physical newspaper. Um, so obviously I'm an old bloke reading a newspaper in a cafe, but uh, that's one of my places I find where I can get uh, some peace and quiet and R&R. Very good, John. You just touched on something that I'd like you to explain a little bit more to our listeners, which may surprise them. Are you saying church leaders also struggle 
with being overcluttered in their minds and, and overexposed to technology? Yeah, very much. I mean, every every pastor and uh, people listening to churchgoers who you know have a pastor or multiple pastors on their team in larger churches, um, yeah, they're just as human as the person in the pew. And so they have the same sort of challenges and struggles um, at a personal level. And I was listening to that previous caller about, you know, challenges in her family, that uh, they have the same challenges in their family and their own personal life. And I find also that uh, pastoring church leaders at that pastoring level are, are really, um, they're kind of on the equivalent, I think, it's in some areas of stress load uh, of first responders. And so they find it sometimes hard to wind down the adrenaline rush. Um, now, people may think, Jesus, my pastor get an adrenaline rush on Sundays when he's preaching or leading a meeting? Absolutely. There's a nervous edge to doing that. I, I pastored for 30 years in our church, and um, there is an adrenaline nervous edge that comes with a Sunday service for a pastor. You want things to do well. You want people to be discipled. You want people to come to Christ. You want you want people to be be connected with the worship and with the preaching. And so that can create a real sense of adrenaline rush. And then you get those often what's called the Monday blues for pastors, where they kind of like, well, I didn't do a great job yesterday, or you know, I didn't kind of feel like it really worked that well. Um, and they do a self assessment that can be quite overly critical. So. Helping pastors find uh, and church leaders find a rhythm of rest, of downtime, of letting things go, finding positive distractions, finding a hobby that's outside church world is one of the things I do in my consulting is actually, hey, what sort of hobby have you got? Maybe your hobby is going to the gym. I think it's a great hobby, actually, because you, you mix up the exercise um, with some, you know, just totally non-church sort of things. And I, I think for pastors, it, it is hard to get away from their particular workplace because their workplace is their worship place. Um, so it makes it for an interesting mix for pastors. Yeah, interesting. Um, Daniel, have you got a response for John today? Look, I would agree with it. I mean, I worked as a pastor, a paid pastor for 10 years, so I do have a sense of the uh, challenges. And what I would say is I, th I think that we're, we're absolutely as prone as anyone else, if not more. Uh, I remember a friend of mine went to Italy. No, it was uh, Greece, sorry. And he saw these um, Greek Orthodox kind of priests in their garments and robes and uh, pulling out their phone and scrolling TikTok, completely addicted. And so <laughs> it was such a contrasting view. Uh, I, I really do like Rod Dreyer's work, who's a... Uh, he was a Catholic. I think he's Orthodox now, but he wrote the Benedict Solution, and he suggests that uh, that technology is one big blind spot for the Christian church, and we haven't taken seriously the deep impact of the, of technology on making disciples and of counterforming people in the ways of God, that technology is embedded with ideas, and those ideas don't necessarily draw us towards the type of life we would want in Jesus. Uh, and I see that all the time. I think if we don't tackle and seriously address the habits that we have ourselves and the habits in our own communities uh, around technology, well, then we will struggle to raise up healthy, loving, robust, faithful humans, uh, which is what both of my books are about. So I, I would agree that you need patterns and rhythms in that sense. Excellent. And John, I want to thank you for calling in today and sharing your journey. And I love that image of you in the cafe reading the newspaper like an old guy. I'm sure of the uh, the newspaper that's printing that is very happy that you're reading it because even reading a newspaper is becoming a dying art, isn't it? Well, very much so. I'm, I'm often the only guy in the cafe reading a newspaper, but I, I find the tactile experience of, of, and I read The Australian, I'll give them a plug. It's a big newspaper. You really have to kind of wrestle with the thing to get on different pages, but I just like, it, it slows you down, the, the reading, and you're not distracted. You're not kind of rushing from this section to that section. You kind of hang around an article, get a bit of news, and I just find that um, that whole process slows me down mentally and emotionally. And also because it, it's like, I remember when I, as a teenager surfing, when you're out there surfing, all you're thinking about is the next wave coming across the horizon. You're actually not thinking about anything else. And that, that itself is mentally relaxing. And I find the newspaper, this may sound strange to people, but I find the newspaper the same, is that if I'm reading an article about, uh, you know, well-written article about an interesting topic that I'm fascinated by, I find everything else melts. 
everything else vanishes, that I'm just involved in that and I'm thinking about it. And uh, again, it's uh, probably better for my eyes that it's not a screen. Um, yeah, so I'm an avid, avid buyer of newspapers. They, they love me when I wander into the local deli and grab, grab the grab the more expensive newspaper rather than the local rags. <laughs> so they're happy for my business. Yeah, Daniel, hasn't there been some studies done too that there's something about reading a page, reading the words across a page is better for your mental development than reading words on a screen? Well, it's definitely a different experience without a doubt because the medium that you engage with shapes your experience. Uh, I like what John talked about. He actually described what the research would call flow or deep work where you actually get into a particular zone, you feel like time flies because you're, you're, you're doing a single task, you're concentrating and you've got the time to actually fully engage, which is actually a very pleasurable experience. So for me, I'll get it when I'm riding my bike, mountain biking, because I can't focus on something else. I'll also get it when I'm writing a book or um, when I'm you know, in a deep dive in a presentation without any notifications. So I think there is great joy in that flow, uh, however you get there. I think, John, it'd be funny um, if one day someone turns up at the cafe and asks you what that thing actually is. That's when you know that uh, <laughs> we're getting old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's a lot easier than riding a mountain bike, Daniel, so I'll stick to my newspaper. It's a lot safer and easier. <laughs> sounds, sounds good. Hopefully newspapers uh, stay around a little bit longer. I, I do enjoy them occasionally myself. They also come oh, in well. handy when you're camping when you want to start a fire. But, uh, John, uh, <laughs> and that's not... Camping or mountain bike riding, cafes and newspapers my go. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, we want to thank you for your call from beautiful WA today. And, uh, yeah, thanks for joining the conversation on 2020 today. Thanks, Andrew and Daniel. Great conversation. Yeah, Daniel, we are approaching the end of our conversation, but let's just flesh out that whole concept of deliberate rest that you were touching on after the uh, the news earlier. Let, let's go there again. Let's talk about intentional rest. Mm. So, look, I think the question then is, what is work? And if work, for example, involves a lot of communication online, or if it doesn't, the question is, if you have a day off, I, I'm a big believer in Sabbath, in an intentionally structured day, overtly, overtly, certainly in a very deliberate way to plan a day that is different from the rest. And for that, uh, I've been very intentional to do things that which is why I turn off my phone. I put my. We do watch together because I don't get to do that during my week. Go the internet and I won't communicate on my. That always makes me. But then I fill with life giving that are true. And, and so I enjoy walking. I enjoy getting in the garden. I, I like chainsawing, actually. I've got a lot of land. And I find chainsawing is meditative and I can't think about anything else. Concentrate. Uh, but I'm physical, I'm outdoors, or I'm connected to life and those things. I'm not just... Daniel, we, um, we've got the, the Skype is just coming in and out, but um, I heard some great things there. You like chainsawing. Well, you're a man after my own heart. We had a, uh, a house there on the river at Brisbane a few years ago and I had a chainsaw and I used to love chopping those trees down and carving them up and we had a fireplace we used to be able to burn the logs at night and uh, there's something very therapeutic about it isn't it getting in touch with nature you also said you like walking and I think it's just really um, you, what you were touching on there is just going there intentionally of not just letting life happen to you and allowing yourself to be bombarded and tossed to and fro by the technological winds blowing but actually to make a conscious decision and and, um, and Daniel, I think it reminds me of God in the book of Genesis where it says he worked for six days, he made this beautiful world, but then it says God rested. And I don't think God rested because someone told him to rest. I think God decided, I need to rest now. I need to just do nothing for a whole day and just chill. And I say this to people, especially busy people, if God rested, then you and I need some rest as well. And uh, Daniel, I'm going to try and get a good buy out of you, but the, uh, the Skype's been playing up a little bit. Are you uh, still there? Yeah, I'm still there. Yeah, absolutely. If you can't hear the camera. Yeah, we're breaking up, mate. But, you know, it has been a brilliant conversation today, Daniel. I want to remind people that you are about to launch a podcast called Space Makers. Um, there's also a book you've written called Space Maker, How to Unplug, Unwind, and Think Clearly in the Digital Age. And you've also, um, you know... Um, 
appeared on a TED podcast. And if people want to get in touch with you, your name is spelt Daniel S I H. That's Daniel C. And Space Makers also has a website. So it's Space Makers. And I love that name, Daniel. It does remind me of the cartoon Space Ghost. Spacemakers.com.au. That's spacemakers.com.au. We've had Daniel C on the show today, answering your calls and offering some real gold nuggets of wisdom on how to declutter our lives and regain our attention. Daniel, if you can hear me, thank you again so much for your time today. Andrew, I appreciate it.